Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at the early medieval period in our continuing study of the history of civilization. Theodoric had been a Ostrogothic noble. Now, he had been a Arian, which means he believes that Jesus is the Son of God, but has some issues with the, with the Trinity, uh, and held hostage in Constantinople, which brings him, gives him an, now, when I say he was hostage, doesn't mean he was in prison or anything like that. He's, he's raised in Constantinople, and therefore giving allegiance to the emperor who's in Constantinople, and he's sent now b uh, to Italy to take Italy back from Odoacer, who had, who had deposed the Roman emperor in the west and had remember sent him on vacation and had said now I'm in charge and he gets there and he makes a treaty with Odiaser, um, but they sit down to celebrate the treaty at a formal dinner and and Odoacer is put to death and Theodoric now has has taken back the empire supposedly for the emperor in Constantinople And so he sends word back. He says, Mi mission successful. We have recaptured it. And I'll be here ruling it on your behalf. <laughs> in other words, he doesn't give it back. He, he stays in charge. And so we're going to have Italy not returning to the Eastern Roman Empire, but uh, only returning in name, but not, not actuality. So what we have now are a collection of various tribes and peoples that are ruling what used to be the Western Roman Empire. We've got the Ostrogoths, the Burgundians, the Jutes. Uh, in, over in England, we have the Angles and the Saxons. Uh, we have the Franks, and we're going to talk about them in just a moment. The Visigoths, which is just another way of saying the Western Goths, and a subset of those, the Vandals in North Africa. And and that's just a few. That's just a few of. Uh, the many peoples that have taken now the Western Empire and broken up into bite-sized chunks and and are just uh, ruling and reigning uh, throughout that we that part of Western Europe. The Franks in particular, uh, with Clovis, begins a dynasty that we know as the Morovian dynasty. Uh, it's going to rule for nearly 300 years. Uh, and Clovis is a He's, he's not an Arian, he's a, he's a Christian and a Trinitarian Christian. Uh, now, he, he converts to, to Christianity. Uh, he comes to power, converts to Christianity, and it's the Catholic Christianity, that, that is the Trinitarian Christianity. And he says, because I'm a Christian, all my people are going to be Christian as well. Uh, in fact, he says, now, I, I want my, my army, my soldiers, there's my cavalry over there. They need to be Christians. Uh, you guys need to be baptized. Uh, see that river over there? Ride through that river. Uh, and that'll be your baptism. Y you can see there's not a lot of theology yet to their Christianity, but, you know, th they're starting, and then they're going to catch up later on. Uh, by the way, as the soldiers are riding through the river, they're saying, gee, we've heard Christians, um, they love each other, and they're not necessarily fighting each other. Uh, we don't want our sword arm to be baptized. So they, they raise their right arm and hold it out of the river so it doesn't get baptized too. Um, y like I said, y you've, you've got to give them credit for trying, but they don't really understand Christianity yet, but they will. This is, this is their advent into it. Meanwhile, in the East, just a few years later, we have Justinian coming to the throne of Constantinople uh, in the Eastern Empire. Now, Justinian has a girlfriend by the name of Theodora, who's an actress, and that was considered scandalous uh, for an a would-be emperor, a, an up-and-coming prince who's going to be an emperor, to have a actress as a girlfriend, because that was considered just maybe one step higher than a prostitute. Uh, and he wants to marry her, but her his parents won't allow it. But then once they have died, once he becomes the emperor, uh, he's going to take, in 527, he comes to the throne, and he takes Theodora as his bride, uh, actress tur turned empress. And it's shortly after that, that a riot breaks out. Now, it's not over that. Well, maybe it had something to do with it. But it's really, it's called the Niki Revolt. Um, and this riot breaks out because of the chariot races. They really take their chariot races seriously. You know, you go to Europe sometimes today, and, and soccer is sort of the rage. And, and people, I even read about riots taking place at soccer games. Well, back then it was the chariot races. And you'd have the blues and the greens, and, and people were really up in arms if their team didn't win. And, and a riot has broken out, and 
the city is in danger of falling to the rioters and Justinian soldiers come to him and say, we need to get out of town. Uh, we've got a ship stocked and ready uh, to make your escape. And he says, okay, honey, uh, says to his, his bride, uh, let's go. And Theodora says, no, no, empresses do not run away. And he says, huh? That's right. Empresses do not run away. They may be put to death. They may die, but that's okay. But they don't turn around and run. And he says, oh, well, I guess emperors shouldn't be running either. And he says, he turns to his generals and he says, we need to come up with plan B. And he's got this young general by the name of Belisarius who comes up with plan B. <laughs> and he arranges it where um, he, he puts out the word that the emperor and his wife have gone to the, to the stadium and the rioters saying, are saying, here's where we can capture them and take them. And they, uh, they converge on the stadium and it's a trap that Belisarius has set, as, as he, and he's going to do this a lot. He's going to be renowned for his, his innovative tactics, uh, for being a tremendous general, maybe second only to Alexander, but not, he's not going to be a, a king setting himself up in power. He will always be loyal to Justinian. And so he's going to make Justinian great, and he saves the day with the Nikki revolts, and now that Justinian is secure upon the throne, uh, we see Belisarius eventually retaking uh, Italy and North Africa and parts of Spain. In other words, restoring the Roman Empire. Now, it's not, not going to last. Once Justinian has died, that's sort of going to fly apart at the heels. But at least temporarily, the Roman Empire comes back together. Justinian next sets out to build what will be called the Hagia Sophia, a great basilica. Now, that's, that's like a church, but it's bigger than a church. The, the word basilica means kingdom. It's the kingdom of heaven and yet on earth. And he sets, he sets out to build this. It's a tremendous undertaking because the Hagia Sophia, uh, it's topped by a giant dome. And this is an earthquake zone. Now, earthquakes happen here all the time. What's going to stop this dome from falling in? Well, it's held up by a series of smaller domes that surround it, that even out the weight, and if there's an earthquake, that even out the shaking. And it becomes a tremendous uh, architectural wonder. When he is finished, he, he announces, uh, Justinian announces, O Solomon, with your temple, Solomon, I have outdone you. And so it's finished in 537. Uh, and as I said, the, the dome, you can see from the outside, it sits on a number of smaller domes that redistribute the, the weight. And the columns, and not the one that you see here, but the columns on the inside uh, are brought from Ephesus, from the Temple of Artemis. Remember that temple uh, in Acts chapter 19? Uh, uh, the rioters were saying, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. They were worried that if this Christianity stuff takes hold, that the the Temple of Artemis will descend into just uh, abject poverty, and indeed <laughs> it's disassembled and brought to Ephesus. Justinian, in his later year, years, he uh, undertakes to to rewrite, and he's not changing the laws, but he's just codifying them. So the Code of Justinian is taking all the laws that had been passed over all the centuries, because they still view themselves as part of the Roman Empire, and and making them all work together so that they're not they're not contradicting each other, so that there's uniformity in the law in this code of Justinian. Um, however, he enters into a series of wars now with Persia, and that weakens the empire. And on top of this, a plague breaks out. Maybe maybe brought over from Persia. I'm not sure where it came from, uh, but a plague breaks out that kills maybe maybe as many as one in every four or every five people. And so the population is decimated by this plague. Meanwhile, you have the Lombards. They are coming down, migrating in 568 down into Italy. Uh, and, and I have both pagans and some Christians, but they're Aryan Christians. They're not believing the Trinity. Uh, and so I, I've got within Christianity some disunity taking the place. Not in Constantinople. In Constantinople, they're still Trinitarian. And I'm going to see uh, a return to Trinitarianism uh, in the West as well. But for a time, there's these others that are coming in and making both their, their, 
their beliefs and even in the realm of Christianity, their doctrines um, upsetting things. In the East, after the death of Justinian, I have a, a um, Roman centurion. He murders the emperor, this is in the year 602, um, and he makes himself the, the new emperor. His name is, is Phocas. He's not going to be a good guy. And the Persians see this, uh, this unrest in Constantinople, and they take the opportunity, the Persian Shah takes the opportunity to invade and march to the very doors to the very walls of Constantinople. It looks like the empire in the east is about to fall. Uh, Jerusalem has fallen to him. The whole east has fallen to him, Egypt. And now Constantinople is being besieged. And Phocas is not up to the task of defending it, and he dies. Well, fortunately, Focus doesn't last very long, and he's succeeded by Heraclius. In fact, it sounds a little bit like Hercules, and he's going to be a political Hercules. Because Hercules, he leaves Constantinople in the hands of the patriarch. He actually says to the patriarch, you're in charge. Hold things together. I'll be back. And, uh, and he, he takes his army, and he invades Persia. Now, he's got, he's got Persia right on the doors, right outside the walls of Constantinople. He bypasses them, takes his ships, sails across the, the southern end of the Black Sea, lands, and then marches right into the Persian Empire. And the, you know, the Persian emperor is outside the doors of Constantinople saying, where do you go? And he's invaded Persia and in danger of pulling the whole Persian Empire down. And, and the Shah has to turn around and go back to to save his empire. And so, uh, as a result, Hercules manages to retake all the lands that had fallen to the Persian Shah, both Anatolia and, and Jerusalem and Egypt, and it, he, he brings it all back. But in doing so, these two great kingdoms have clashed. It's been a, a, a war of epic proportions. Really, we could almost call it a world war. And it has battered these two nations, these two empires, down to a bloody pulp. And in the vacuum of the aftermath, we're going to see a new power arise, a power to the south. It's going to come from a merchant by the name of Muhammad, who claims to have a revelation from God, living down in Arabia. He's, he's just a merchant. Uh, he, now, he he is directed in this revelation to become a monotheist. Arabia had been largely, largely polytheistic, beliefs, beliefs in many gods. Had, uh, they had had some exposure to Christianity, but usually it was Christians who had, been, who had been excommunicated and banished because of their wrong beliefs against Christianity. And so perhaps his exposure was to wrong views of Christianity. He's a monotheist, um, the religion that he is going to found will be known as Islam. It just means submission. The idea that we must submit to the will of God. And the writing that will come forth, now he's not going to write it, because supposedly he can't, he can't read and write. He's illiterate. But he, he recites these things, and they are written down. They become the recitations. The way you say that is the Quran. And he moves to Medina in 622, when he's asked to come and to officiate between two clans that aren't getting along, and he's going to sort of settle things, and that marks his growth in, um, in power and in influence, and he will return, he'll, he'll actually lead Medina back to uh, Mecca in 630, where he comes from, and he'll conquer the city of Mecca for this new, and in the name of this new religion of, of Islam. And so the Muslims will conquer Me Mecca. And from Mecca, they will go forth. Uh, in fact, uh, they, they will, in, in, in sort of, I guess you could call it downtown Mecca, there's this rock that was revered and worshipped and, and uh, was thought to be sort of from the gods. And he's going to take it and sort of sanctify it and say, no, that's just from the one god. Uh, and they'll build a big monument around it. still there today. Um, you can't go there yet. You have to be a Muslim in order to go there. Um, but it's still in Mecca today. Uh, another holy place will, will be Jerusalem, 
where supposedly this will be the site of the al uh, Miraj, that is the ascent. Now it's not like where Jesus ascends into heaven. Rather, for for Muhammad, it's supposed to be a vision that he has, where he, he ascends spiritually, and but then he comes back. Uh, and the site of that will be on the Temple Mount, and and they will eventually, after his death, uh, they will build what's called the Dome of the Rock, that still stands there today on the site of the original Temple in Jerusalem. Uh, it was completed in 691, long after his death. Um, but that that is considered one of the holy sites for the Muslims. Now, the beliefs of Islam, first of all, their uh, their belief is that there's no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. Um, the, so they're monotheist, um, and they claim not just that Muhammad is a prophet, they, they claim to believe in the books sent by God, uh, and those books as they see them, are the Suhuf, the writings of Abraham. Now, that's, they don't say it's Genesis. Um, well, you say, where are those writings of, of Abraham? Well, they don't have them, um, but they're reflected, supposedly, in the, uh, in the Quran. Also, the Torah, uh, that is the Torah. Uh, but again, they, you know, if you say, well, here's what the Torah says, well, they, they disagree with that. So, they would say, well, it's as it was originally written, but nobody has that, so uh, they've sort of re reinterpreted it and reworked that. Uh, the Zabur, the Psalms, uh, but again, they don't really listen to everything they said. The Injil, the Gospels, but if you read the Gospels to them, they'll deny a lot that's in the Gospels because the Gospels present Jesus as the Messiah, uh, the Son of God, and they reject that. Um, in fact, their statement of faith um, states that they reject the idea that God is Father, Son, and Virgin Mary. You say, wait a minute, Christians don't believe that. Well, that's true, but remember, uh, Islam is the result of exposure to wrong views of Christianity, and so reflects those wrong views. Uh, they, Of course, the Quran is their, their ultimate uh, book, and the one that sort of judges all those other writings, uh, supposedly. The Islam also uh, claims belief in all the prophets. They claim Jesus is one of those prophets. My my remark to them is, well, why don't you listen to what he says about himself? Um, a belief in angels, um, because remember the um, the Islam is supposedly started when an angel appears to Muhammad. Sort of reminds me a little bit of something the Apostle Paul said, where the Apostle Paul said, if anyone speaks any other message to you, any other gospel, other than that which has been preached to you, let him be a curse. Even if an angel from heaven, as though from angel, heaven, preaches another message to you, let him be accursed. Well, that that's what the New Testament has to say about about this sort of religion. Um, they have a belief in, in a future day of judgment, uh, a belief in predestination, uh, but it almost mirrors sort of a fatalism. You see, the Bible teaches about predestination, uh, but in the in the biblical in the biblical narrative, uh, our our decisions really do matter. It's not that they work against predestination. You know, God's God's bigger than our decisions, uh, but it's not a fatalism either. Uh, and so Islam will say God has already written down what will happen, and so therefore it's it's a little bit of fatalistic in in its outlook. Now, the practices of Islam, first of all, there's the confession, which we already uh, stated. There's no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. Uh, it calls for prayer five times a day, facing Mecca. And, and personally, I think prayer is a good thing. Uh, and to have regular seasons of prayer, I think, is a good thing. Uh, alms to the poor, again, those, those are good things. Uh, it's not the practices that I have issue with in Islam. It's their, well, it's, it's their belief system. Uh, fasting during the month of Ramadan. You say, well, which month is that? It's a lunar calendar, so it changes from year to year, uh, and it might be, you know, one month uh, co corresponding to our calendar, one year and another month. It, so it changes. It rotates uh, throughout all the seasons of the year. Um, each each year it changes. Uh, Islam also calls for a pilgrimage to Mecca, uh, and I'm, I don't think a pilgrimage to Mecca is going to help you that much. But I think it is good if you're able to visit the Holy Land and to visit Israel to see, uh, not necessarily as a pilgrimage, but just to see where these things take place. It, it's a wonderful opportunity if you're able to take that. Now, Muslims are going to put certain restrictions in the conquered territories. We'll see where they go eventually. 
uh, upon Christians and upon Jews, where Christians and Jews are required to wear a special mark on their clothing. Uh, there's no proselytizing permitted. It's, it's not permitted to share the gospel and lead somebody else to Jesus, both then and today in any Muslim country. So that, for example, even a, a Muslim country like Turkey that's supposed to be very westernized, if, if, a, if, you, sh if you lead somebody to Jesus, your life can be forfeit. And I say that, that's not just theoretical, that's actual. Uh, I have a, a friend who many years ago was, was in Turkey and sharing the gospel. And there was a knock at his door and, and gunmen came in and they, they shot and killed him. Um, so that's still true today. Uh, no new churches were allowed or, or synagogues were allowed to be built. The old ones were allowed to continue standing. And so you can go to Muslim countries, uh, for example, in Turkey, you can go to Izmir, um, what used to be Smyrna many years ago in, in the city of Izmir. You can still go into the church of Polycarp. It's still standing today, and it was allowed to remain. But no new churches or synagogues were allowed to be built. Uh, no church bells could be rung, uh, and the involvement of Christians and Jews in politics was limited. Now, it, that religion of Islam is going to set out from Mecca. It will go to the very doors of Constantinople. It will also go to the east and overcome Persia. It will go all throughout Arabia, across North Africa, and all the way uh, across the, the, um, the Straits of Gibraltar into France. With, it will come within 100 miles of Paris. We'll cross Sicily. Uh, they'll be fighting at Malta and Sicily. As, as Islam is spread through the sword. That's all, always the way it has been spread. Uh, they will go down the Nile River, and at Ethiopia, they will, it will come to the king of Ethiopia, and he'll say, uh, you guys can come and talk to us, but we're all Christians here. We don't want you know, any other religion. Uh, but it will be spread by the sword, because that's the way Islam is always spread. At the Battle of Tours in France, Charles Martel, that's a nickname, Charles the Hammer is what it means, uh, he in 732 will face the Muslim advance and will halt it at the city of Tours in France. And at, it's at this point that just short of 100 miles of Paris that the advance of the Muslims will be halted and will gain no further, at least for the time being, into Western Europe. Although there will be attempts and eventually they will make great gains in Eastern Europe. Charles's fa uh, yeah, Charles' son, uh, Pepin the Short, uh, comes to the throne in uh, 752. He's the son of Charles Martel, and initially governs France with his older brother, but he's going to be, uh, he's going to succeed the last of the Moravian dynasty, where he begins, he's actually sort of what was called a mayor, and then, and then you know, as the Moravian dynasty passes away, uh, he takes over and reigns in its place. Uh, and he will also establish the papal states. That is, uh, he will say to the Pope, you know, there's some, some you know, tiny little kingdoms and cities down there. Uh, tell you what, you run that uh, as, as, you know, sort of independently. Yes, you'll be loyal to me, but you're going to be governor of that. And so the Pope no longer will be just Bishop of Rome, no longer will be just a religious ruler, but he will also be a, I guess you could call him a king or a governor of, of these states. Pepin the Short is succeeded by his son Charles. He's going to be known as Charles the Great. The way you say that is Charlemagne, uh, the grandson of Charles Martel, who is crowned emperor of a united Central Europe in the year 800 AD. Nice round number, easy to remember. And it's the Pope who places the crown upon his head. And by doing so, later popes are going to say, see, we put the crown on your head, we can take it off as well. Uh, and that's, go that's going to be a sticking point later on. Now, Charlemagne, he promotes schools and learning. Not that he could necessarily was that educated himself. In fact, it said that uh, when he used to go to bed, he'd keep a little writing tablet by his bed where he'd practice his ABCs. But he thought highly of that. And he's encouraging schools and he's encouraging learning. Uh, and at his death, 
his kingdom is divided between his sons. That's going to be a problem because if you have a kingdom and you have several sons and you die and it's divided, then that kingdom just got smaller by at least half. Uh, maybe several, you know, and then if they each give it to their sons, then you're going to have, instead of one big kingdom, you're going to have many, many, many small little tiny kingdoms. Uh, and anybody can come and just wipe those up. And so that's going to be a growing problem that will lead to a solution. And we'll be seeing later on what the solution will be to that. Now, we have Charlemagne crowned in 800. And that will begin a series. And it, it just so happens. He, it's not because of him. Can't blame him. But meanwhile, from the north, you have Vikings that will begin their raiding of northern Europe. And they won't be, the Vikings won't be limited to northern Europe. Um, they're coming down from the north, and they have a new invention, the longboat. It's, it's shallow draft. And these longboats, um, yes, they're seaworthy, but also because of the shallow draft, they can go right up the rivers. And any navigable river is now a highway for the Vikings. Uh, they're pagans. They're not Christians. It's going to be quite a few hundred years before they begin to adopt Christianity. It will be slow in coming, but it will come. Eventually, we'll see people from the north uh, becoming Christians, but it's going to take a while. Some of them will settle, for example, in northern France, uh, where these Northmen will become, <laughs> will become known as Normans. Uh, in fact, we talk about the Norman conquest of, of Great Britain, and that will eventually come. Those are going to be descendants of the Vikings, these, these Northmen, these Normans. Um, they will uh, go up the Volga all the way uh, throughout Rus, or what we call Russia today. Uh, and they will make their way all... Th and, and here you have people sometimes that are living 100, 200 miles from the ocean, and yet here come the Vikings up the river. Uh, they will go through the Straits of Gibraltar all the way to Sicily. They will attack Constantinople first in 865 and again in, in the year 907. And the, the emperor at Constantinople will be so impressed that he will hire them. The Byzantine emperor will hire a contingent of the Vikings. He'll say, hey, you can work for me. You don't have to raid and pillage. I'll pay you to, to, to work for me. And they will do that. We will eventually have English missionaries taking life in hand and going to the Vikings and bringing the gospel to them. And that will bring about a great change as we see Christianity coming to the lands of the, of the north. Now, these Viking incursions are going to lead to a necessary stratification of what the Europeans are going to call the great chain of being. So that you have the Pope on top, at least he says so. Uh, of course, God's on top. Uh, and then the king. Uh, remember, the Pope put the crown upon uh, Charlemagne, and so the Pope sees himself on top. And then the king, and then he might have nobles that, that, are, um, that are serving him. Uh, they, these nobles have, have different little fiefdoms and, and communities and, and counties and things. And that's why you have a count. He's in charge of a county and things like that. Uh, and then under them, you have the, either the knights or the vassals. And the knights, these are the, the soldiers who actually have enough money to, to have a horse and have maybe some armor and some weapons. And the vassals, um, not so much. But we're going to see they, they get a certain amount of weaponry, too. You have the merchants and the craftsmen. Uh, these are more socially, uh, they're, they're, they're socially further down, and yet they, or they can buy and sell, and they're, they're necessary. And then down at the, at the bottom you have the peasants, and then the serfs. The difference between the two, the serfs are tied to the land. They, they can't go anywhere they want. Um, and, yet, and the peasants uh, are tied maybe economically, but they are able to move if they have the wherewithal to do, to do that. And so the Viking threat help solidify this feudalistic system. Um, there's a need for local protection, and the king can't be everywhere, and so he has both nobles and, and knights working for the nobles, and nobles uh, serving him, and, and this is needed to protect against this Viking threat. And eventually, this will give rise to the idea of states, of countries, but that hasn't quite happened yet. 